guy with Mexican outfit, had Mexican singing, and it is tremendous. Praise God. Uh, Sunday morning here, Pastor Jamie had a leading for for uh, everyone to, to sign their name for a card and then take them up to the altar and people go up and get someone's card and pray for them. Uh, these, these cards didn't have anybody to pick them up, so we want to pray for them. And, uh, and, and, and Billy Strode, Strode he's, he's going to have next Tuesday, they're going to go in and, and catheterize a part of his heart. Or that keeps going out of the uh, rhythm. So pray for Billy. Billy is his name. And pray for the Marinette's Passion Play. Because it's they're going on each night. And that's a tremendous, big, humongous production. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you. Go see it. It's at 7 o'clock every night. It is tremendous. We went up to Sunday night. But I'm going to pray for these uh, cards. And ask the Lord to uh, minister. Some of you men come up and we'll, we'll lay hands on these cards. And uh...
It would not have been a miracle to them if he had been resurrected the third day because the Jews believed the spirit of the person hovers over the, over the dead body for three days and the third day goes. And so Jesus, Jesus waited intentionally four days. And so Lazarus was dead dead. <laughs> he, he, was, he was dead dead in the Jews' eyes. But John 12, verse 18, tells you that's why the crowd gathered. You might write that down. That's one of the reasons. Now, it was Passover, and there were 2 million estimated people in Jerusalem. But, but Bethany is just on the other side of the Mount of Olives, where Lazarus was resurrected. So Jesus came up the hill, Mount of Olives, descended, already had a preparation, the donkey and the colt. I told those that were here on Sunday... There were actually two animals. There was the donkey and then the, the foal of the donkey, the colt. And I believe there was symbolism there. The donkey had been ridden. The colt had never been ridden. The donkey is the old. The colt is the new. The donkey is the, the, the old covenant. The, the colt is the new covenant. And anything used for a sacred purpose was never to be used before for anything else. That's why it was a colt that had never been ridden on. His tomb, no man had ever laid in. The womb of Mary, no man had ever penetrated in sexual intercourse. So everything that relates to the, to, the, to the ministry of Jesus relates to new things. And that's why it's a new covenant. Come on now. It's a new way. It's a new birth. Oh, my, my, my. You're a new creation. It goes on and on. You're going to a new Jerusalem, and you're going to be in a new heaven. Wow. And so when he enters into Jerusalem through the eastern gate, the golden gate, Mark 11, 11 tells you he's in the temple. Now, you've got to get over something about, about the temple. Uh, anytime uh, someone sees Jesus and it says he's, at the, he's in the temple, he's not in the temple because only, only the priests, the Levites, could go into the temple. The temple was a, was a building here, but outskirts that they had the eastern gate you had what's called the temple area and and they could teach in here that they could he could go anywhere and draw a crowd and teach and, and the money changers were in in there selling the the high priced animals to be sacrificed and also they were taking uh the the currency uh, of the people and and making a profit on it and the pharisees charged about three percent to all of these money changers uh, to have a spot in the temple area because they controlled the temple. So they were making money right and left. The Pharisees were making money. The money changers were making money. People selling them. The animals were making money. Of course, most of the people who came to Passover came from, from a long way off and they didn't bring their animals to sacrifice. And you had to have an animal sacrifice so they had turned it into a polluted place. A polluted place. Now here's something that's very, very interesting. This is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, he enters into Jerusalem. Now, most, most people sitting in the church pews believe that's when he cleansed the temple. But if you read the scriptures, he actually cleans the temple on Monday, the day after Palm Sunday. And I'll show you the scriptures for that. Now, the last thing in your notes here, on Palm Sunday, he retires and goes to Bethany. That's Mark 11.11. 11, and I'll read Mark 11.11. 11. It says, And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around, this is Mark 11, 11. Now you better, you better go in the Word. Mark 11, 11. He goes into the temple area. He looks around. It says in Mark 11, 11. He looks around at all the things. As the hour was already late, that means when he got into Jerusalem, it was late in the evening. The hour was late, and he went out to Bethany with his twelve. That means he had to climb up the Mount of Olives back down into Bethany. Who lived in Bethany? Lazarus lived in Bethany. And Lazarus and Mary and Martha were very wealthy and that's where he stayed. Here's something you put down in your notes. Jesus never in his ministry spent the night in the city of Jerusalem until he was captured. All the times he came into Jerusalem and left. He did not stay inside the city gates of Jerusalem until he was captured. So he goes to Bethany and Mark 11, 11 tells you, Palm Sunday, rides in, they're all cheering, throwing their 
coats down, waving palm branches, praising him with a loud voice. Things begin to happen. And then it's evening, and he goes back to Bethany, no doubt, stays with Lazarus. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, if, if Jesus had come into your home and, 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 and raised one of your loved ones from the dead, do any of you think you'd probably give him a bedroom to stay there overnight? <laughs> huh? And feed him, probably more than likely feed him. And if he needed anything, he'd make sure he had it. Is that correct? <laughs> come on now. How many of you got saved? You ought to be... <laughs> That's a resurrection from the dead because we were all dead in sins and trespasses and the Lord has made us alive. Now, with the Word of God, with the Word of God, we're going to look and see what the Word says about Monday. Sunday's over. Rides in. Now it's Monday. Watch this. Look at Mark 11, chapter, verse 12. Mark 11, 12. Now the next day, now if Sunday was Palm Sunday, then the next day would be what? Monday. Monday. So he spends the night in Bethany, and the next day, <laughs> when they had come from, out of, from Beth Bethany, he was hungry. Now that amazes me right there, because I thought for sure Mary and Martha would have fixed him breakfast. <laughs> But you don't know how early he left. Yeah, you don't know how early he left. So he's hungry. And, he, and seeing, verse 13, now it's Monday, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves. Having leaves. So he approached it. So he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. Does anybody here knew he knew there was nothing on it? <laughs> he knew there was nothing on it. He's doing this for a reason. He didn't just do things by accident. He knew, he knew there was nothing on it, but he goes up. His disciples are with him. Verse 12 says his disciples are with him, so he goes up to the fig tree, and he would find something on it, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Does anybody here know what the fig tree stands for? Who it stands for? Israel. Israel. Always has. Because later in the week, he starts preaching about the blossoming of the fig tree being the rebirth of Israel. So he's going to teach his disciples something about present Israel in his day. They were religious. They worshipped God with their lips, but their walk was heart, far from it. Their hearts. Their hearts. They were religious. Tell your neighbor, religion won't do it. It won't do it. It won't cut it. It won't cut it. You've got to worship him with your heart. So watch what he does. Verse 13. Seeing from afar the fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not, it wasn't even the season for figs. Right. Yeah. <coughs> Watch what he does. In response, Jesus said, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Wow. So basically, he told that fruit tree, Your day. It's come and gone. You, you're not going to be a fruit tree anymore. Forever. And ever. And ever. And ever and ever. Now, jump, look at verse 15. Now, what day are we talking about? Monday. Monday. How do you know? Because it said earlier, he left the temple, and the next day, he comes, he comes back in again from Bethany, and now you look at verse 15, and it's Monday, I said it's Monday because if you want the triumphant entry it was chapter 11 verse 1 of Mark one day went past now you're on Monday and so they came to Jerusalem and Jesus went into the temple this is the second time he's been in the temple and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those that sold doves and he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple then he taught, saying, it is, written, is it not 
written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of what? Jesus. That's what it was, because they were cheating the people. Yes. They were cheating the people. That's exactly what it was. Now, there are people that say you ought not sell anything in a church, blah, blah, blah. That, that's not what it's saying. They were cheating the people. They, they were stealing from the people. They had the, they had the people there, and they couldn't get animals to sacrifice. They had to have a sacrifice. And they had to have temple money only in the temple. So they had to change, and they're making, making a man. Does anyone think there are charlatans in the church today? Let me tell you what to do with it. Selling miracles. For $89.99. There's a, there's a guy in New York called Prophet Son, what he is. He sells prophecies. He sells prophecies. He's on TV. He sells prophecies. And, and, and it's amazing how many precious, precious people, sweet people, get sucked in to that stuff. Uh, you know, thinking they're going to buy a miracle from God. And, and you, you can't buy a miracle. Anytime God touches you, me, anybody, it's an act of love and God's grace. It's undeserved, unearned, and unmerited. Say amen. amen. So he says that in verse 18, and the scribes and the chief priests, this is the religious leaders, they heard it and sought how they might do what to Jesus? Do what? So we take from that that they were not happy. Is that correct? And the reason why they're not happy is they're losing money. They're losing income. He, he's, <laughs> he's messing this thing up. And it's Monday. And he cleansed the temple. Are you home? Yeah. How many of you did not know that he cleansed the temple on Monday? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. But it's right there in the scripture. Yeah, he cleansed, and so they're angry. They want to destroy him. For they feared him. They feared him. Isn't this crazy? He don't have an army behind him, except an army of angels. Because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, what did he do? He left. He left. So Monday comes off the hill. He's hungry. He sees a fig tree. Checks it out. Nothing on it. Literally curses it. Didn't cuss it. There's a difference. You say, well, why did he do that? He owns it. He owns everything. He owns you and he owns me. He can call your number out any day he wants to call your number out. You've got no control. If you, if you live through the night, it will be by God's grace and mercy. Have you ever had one thing happen in a day and change your whole hub? But he, boom, boom. Got up that day, didn't expect anything to happen, and buddy, by evening time, you hit, whoa, 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 whoa. So now he leaves the city again. No doubt goes back to Bethany. Goes to Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. Wow. Isn't it amazing? Now, let's look at I, I put on your paper, Super Tuesday. <laughs> you, you're not going to believe all the things that he does on Tuesday. Now, we can't go over everything because we, we take hours and hours. But if you look, verse 20, now it's morning, it's Tuesday, and as they passed by, coming back down off the Mount of Olives from Bethany, heading back to the temple, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Within 24 hours, zap, pow, bang, that sucker is dead. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If I could get crabgrass to die that quick, I'd be done. <laughs> then I get a witness from anybody yeah. in the house. Yeah. We got onion patches out here on the lawn that we're trying to kill. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Boy. But this thing dried up pow like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We're going there. We're heading that way. We're heading that way. <laughs> And Peter, remembering verse 21, remembering, said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. And so Jesus answered and said to them, now let me tell you something. Anytime you get a scripture, 
please read before it and read after it so you get the context of what's going on. People use this scripture way out of context because they don't realize what happened before this. And so he's saying something. Number one, he says, have faith in who? Your faith has to have a foundation. I've heard preachers share this. Now, you need to have faith in your faith. Nay, nay. No, no, no. Not having faith in your faith. Your, your faith has to have a foundation, has to be God and His Word. Because you can claim anything you want to, but if it's not in God's Word, you don't have anything to stand on. And you've got to have a foundation to be able to stand. And so he says, number one, have faith in God. Let's look next. Verse 23. For surely I say to you, whosoever, and that means anybody who has faith in God, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea. Now let me tell you something. There's no sea visible where he's at. Nor you've been to Jerusalem. There you 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 the Mediterranean Sea is a long way off, and you can't you can't see it. So he's saying here, cast into the sea. Well, you can't see a sea. Anything you can't see, you've got to have what? Faith. Faith. <laughs> Faith. <laughs> cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, there's a key, but believes that those things that he does what? Says. Says. How powerful are your words? Yes, sir. Life and death. Life and death. Yes. Where's that found at? Proverbs. Proverbs where? Anybody know where it's found? Come on, Bible scholars. Preachers, Mark, where's it found? Proverbs. <laughs> I believe it's Proverbs 18. You can check me out. And I believe it's verse 29. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that's where it is. But the life and death are in the power of the tongue. Now be careful because sometimes we have self-fulfilling prophecies. What do you mean, preacher? We say things, not going to make it. it, it it's going to collapse. This thing, I, I tell you, it's going to get it. And, and self-fulfilling prophecies. You've got to be careful what you say. Life and death. Power of the tongue. Have any of you in the house been negative in your entire life? One time. Five of us. The rest of you are lying. <laughs> and the same thing for those watching by internet. It's, it's a key what we say. The devil fights us in our mind. And he, he drags up the past. And, and the past always involves some tragedy, something that, that happened. And, and, and then when you start declaring certain things, there's always someone sitting in a pew near you that's going to say, well, I had, an, I, had an, I had an uncle and I, and I had a cousin and they went through it and oh, they died. There's certain people, if I'm ever in the hospital, I don't want them to come see me. No, I tell you, the minute they walk in, they say, oh my God, I've never seen you look worse. It's the truth. Man, I want someone coming in there. I don't care if they're speaking in tongues, what they're doing. I want someone coming in there with faith. Faith is the key. So it says, there's not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he'll have whatever he does what? Says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, that's how you ask. Believe that you what? Receive them. Then, by faith. They haven't showed up, they haven't manifested, but they're yours. Now, what you should do, what should you do when you've prayed and asked and believed? Thank you. you have to thank him. And then you have to start declaring by faith what you've received before it is manifested and someone's going to call you crazy. Because we go by sight. This is what we say. Listen to me. Now when I see it, I'll believe it. Now, I've heard people say that. Hey, preacher, when I see it, I'll believe it. That's not the work of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is I believe it. And I'm claiming I'm going to see it. Shall you ever word? She's battling cancer. Yes, and I told God I could not, I didn't know I could take this grief anymore. And pretty much told me it was a problem. I said, I can do that. And once I took that, I believe, I know that I know that I can do that. 
you know that you know that you know. That's the key. But don't expect, don't expect every church member to line up with you. Now, I know people say, well, Brother Wright, I just can't believe it. Sister so-and-so came over and, and she told me that's not going to happen and, 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 and it, just, it just got me all discouraged. Let me tell you what, you can't go by what Sister so-and-so said. If, if you believe it and you've got a word for it, you've got to claim your word. But what if it doesn't happen? Let's stop. What if it does happen? You've already praised him before it happens. Does anybody think there's any miracles in this room right now? Come on now. And if it wasn't for God, there's some in this house, we'd already be buried. God's God. Three years ago, he was given three months to live. someone in authority, if you know someone in authority and you, you respect their authority and they tell you, do you know it's a proven fact that there's been a misdiagnosis, there's been x-rays that were, that were not their x-rays, they got x-rays mixed up and the doctors have diagnosed people and said you're going to die in six weeks and guess what they did? They died because their heart believed it, their soul believed it, their spirit believed it and their body reacted to it. God have mercy. And the word says something. Now, it is appointed unto everybody to die. And after that, the judgment. But I'm going to tell you something. I know that I know you, you, can, you, you can hurry up your appointment. There's been people who say, well, it was their time to go. Well, wait a minute. They've been on drugs for three years, hiring a fight, shooting up. Five times they overdosed and, and somehow they brought them back and they died and you say it was their time. I say nay, nay. I say the devil killed them. Yes, sir. Got them doing things they ought not be doing by God's grace. Praise God. Great scripture you quoted, my brother. You shall live and not die and declare the works of your God. So, so he makes a great declaration there and, and verse 25 and excuse me, 26 are key verses also. It deals with forgiving people. Because unforgiveness will cause all kinds of physical problems from ulcers and anything else. You've got to forgive. You don't want to do it to me. I don't want to know. You've you got to forgive them. I don't know if I can. By God's grace, you can forgive them. Forgiveness is, is a key because holding resentment and grudges. And, but Brother Wright, they hurt me. Guess what? We hurt God. We hurt Jesus. And he forgave us. You've got to be able to forgive. So, so, you, 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 see, you see here uh, some great things are, are, are happening. Now, if you jump down to Mark 11 and you start looking uh, on past here, you're going to find out verse 27. If you look at verse 27, Mark, the, the religious authority begin to question. This is Tuesday, Super Tuesday. They begin to question Jesus and they said, they said, by, by what authority do you do the things you're doing? I love Jesus. He says, okay, I'll answer your question if you answer my question. Yes, sir. And my question is, whose authority did John the Baptist come under? Was it God or was it man? Well, these religious leaders, they're stumped because if they say, well, his authority was from God, then Jesus is going to tell us that, well, how come you didn't follow him? And if we say it was man, we're afraid that his followers, people are going to rise up and we're going to get kicked out of office. And so they said, well, we don't have an answer for it. And listen to what Jesus said. He says, neither am I going to answer you. Amen. Hello? Yeah. Does anybody think he put them in their place? Yeah. See, he didn't tremble at their outfits. I, I, please don't get me wrong. Uh, Marie, maybe some of you raised Catholic. Let me tell you something. Do you really believe that Jesus died on the cross, 
to set up an organization where they wear big old hats and robes and do, do, I, I, I don't think so. I, I don't. I don't. I just. I don't see that. That that's that's a religious organization. Do you know that that Catholicism is the is a country? Do you know that the Vatican in Rome in in the in the in the, in the country of Italy that the Vatican is its own country? Do you know it's the only religious group in the world that America sends a representative to? Hello? We send a representative to the Vatican. Like we send it to, to Germany and to Russia. We have a representative. It's a religious institution. And, and I'm not blasting Catholics. I'm just telling you that that's not what Jesus came for. To set up some hierarchy. That's what he had in those days that were challenging his authority and he put them in their place. Say amen. amen. Now, he starts teaching. Now it's Tuesday. And man, he is going to teach and teach and teach and teach and teach. This, this is his last hours. And he, he's teaching on, and, and there's parable. He's teaching on the parable of the two sons. If you want to look at him, it's Matthew 21. You can you can go over to Matthew 21, a parable of, uh, of the two sons. Uh, and and, and he's, he's talking clear, he's telling them things. And then you got the parable of the vineyard, where the workers were going out. Uh, now, let me tell you something. If you, if you, look, if, if you look at uh, the parable of the two sons, Matthew 21, 28. Let's just turn there for that one, just, just one quick second. I want, I want to show you something in, in Matthew 21. Now you've got to get a hold of the fact this is after Palm Sunday. It's two. Matthew 21, verse 28. Anybody there? Yes. Yes. And what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go to work. Go to work. Go to work. <laughs> Any of you got sons? <laughs> go to work. Yeah. Hello? Anybody home? Yeah. Go to work. Work. Go to work. Go to work today in my vineyard. And he said, I, I, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and he went. Then he came to the second son. The second son said, I'll go, but he didn't do it. He got caught up in playing these computer games and just, <laughs> come you on. know, come on. Come on got got yeah. caught up and just couldn't right. do it. That's right. Keep it real. Yeah, and if you spank him, you'll be in jail, so, you know. <laughs> I heard the prosecuting attorney in all county, you know, he's in a mess because he spanked his kid. He, he said, I heard him on the news the other day, he said 70% of the parents in Canal County would be in jail if we arrested everyone that spanked their kids. Hello? I didn't say abused them. Yeah. Jamie, did you ever get spanked? Bless his heart. Someone just asked him, did he deserve it? For you that are watching the internet, he said yes. <laughs> now, now he asked a question, verse 31, which one fulfilled the Father's will? And they said the first one did. Even though he said, I'm not going to go, but I went. And surely I say to you that tax collectors and harlots, prostitutes, will enter the kingdom of God before, now watch, these religious leaders are all around him before you. Hello? Now, if you jump down to verse 45 of the same chapter, you'll see what the reaction is to these parables that he's telling. Parables are illustrations. Let's see if they got hold of the illustration. Verse 45. Now, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they were rejoicing. They were thankful. They were thankful for the truth because you know the truth will set you free. <laughs> now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was talking about them. <laughs> have any of you that preach, have you ever had anybody come up to you and say these words after your sermon? You were talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> Right to me, I mean, right up to me, and say, You were you, you talking about me. Well, thank God I was hitting the target. You know, I mean, I was shooting over here, but somehow I hit you. 
What, who, you, who do you think you're preaching to? The law? Some people that aren't there? And I've also had people come to me and say, Boy, you sure did give it to them today, buddy. <laughs> Notice I'll tell them, Well, I missed the target. <laughs> Now, these Pharisees, now he tells these parables, these parables, and every one of them were at them. And they perceived that he was talking about man. Look what verse 46. But when they sought to lay hands on him, now you've already read once where they wanted to kill him. Now, after he preaches, when he cleansed the temple, they wanted to kill him. Now, after, he's only preached three of these parables. He's got a whole bunch of them to go. They won't lay hands on him. And they don't want to lay hands on him and say, Now, Lord, bless. <laughs> it's not that kind of laying on hands. It's a laying on the hands to do harm. But the reason why they didn't do it, because they feared the multitude, the thousands that were there, who two days earlier had, 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 had been praising him and waving palm branches at him, and when he went into the temple, one of the other gospels says, the blind started seeing and the lame started to walk. So miracles started happening. So they were feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. He's more than a prophet, church. Amen. Now, now, yes, Mark. Sun. We won't look at the Word. 
So here he's talking about, and this is still Super Tuesday. He's talking about the resurrection. Mark 12, verse 18. The Sadducees come to it. The Pharisees believed in resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. They were both under the same uh, uh, Judaism, but they had two different beliefs about the resurrection. Does that sound like Christianity? Yeah. Come on now. You got some people that will tell you that the gifts of the Spirit, they're, they're, they're no more. Yeah. And you got other people who say, yes, the gifts of the Spirit are alive. And so you've got, you got different camps. Yeah. you got different camps in Christianity. They had them there. And so they bring up the craziest story in the world to Jesus. Yeah. That, now, Harry Duck got married and he died and they didn't have any babies and he had seven brothers and, 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 and you know what the law said. Here you go, go back to the law. The law said that he, he should have a baby off his brothers and married that and that dude died. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. That thing had a curse on it because them, all them boys dying. Either that or she's poisoning them. Because she's got seven husbands they all die before she does. Something's going on. Can I get a witness from the media in the house? I mean, look at this. What a story. Seven brothers and they all die. Can you imagine them boys getting to heaven and say, you here now? Today? <laughs> and none of them can have, had a baby. And then finally she dies and the dumb Sadducees who were making fun because yes. uh -huh. yes. they didn't believe in the resurrection. Whose wife is she going to be when they get to heaven? Uh -huh. And Jesus just blasts them out of the water and says, there ain't going to be no marriage or giving in marriage. As a matter of fact, he says it's going to be like the angels. Now, when he says that, it doesn't mean you're going to have wings, floating on a cloud, yeah. plucking a harp. <laughs> you're, you're going to be a, a spirit being with a resurrected body. Yes. And, and the, there's, 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 going to be no, there's going to be no reproducing in heaven. He told Adam and Eve to reproduce, multiply, subdue the earth. In, in heaven, you're not going to have that. So there's not going to be sexual relationships. Or no, it's going to be a different relationship. Are you going to know your companion? Yes. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I believe that with all my heart. I believe with all my heart. Uh, but but he wiped that theory out. He wiped it. You know. And he now when the Pharisees heard that he that he blasted the Sadducees, guess what? Yeah, like I, I like you. I really like you. He's a good guy. Until he turns and blasts them. Two groups, one believed in resurrection, the other one did not believe in resurrection. Now, the Apostle Paul, if you read his life, he uses that. Because when he got, when he got dragged in before the Sanhedrin, he turned them on each other. Yeah. If, you read, if you read about Paul, he, he, he gets in there because you've got Sadducees sitting in the Sanhedrin, you've got the Pharisees sitting in there, and old Paul said, the only reason they've arrested me is because I believe in the resurrection. Yeah. The old Pharisees would say, that's the truth. You Sadducees over there. He knew what he was doing. Yes, sir. Because he was full of the Holy Ghost. Yes. I tell you what, when you are full of the Holy Ghost, you'll, you'll find out he'll give you revelation about things before, they ever, before, before you ever get there. Amen. He said when you, get, when you get hauled in, don't worry about what, don't rehearse what you're going to say. He said when you open your mouth, I'll fill it. I'll fill it with God's grace. So he goes on down. Then they ask him, which is the greatest commandment? Name the number one. What's the greatest commandment? Love God. Love God. All your whole heart, soul, mind. What's number two? Love your neighbor, neighbor yourself. And those two, all of the law hinges on those two. Loving God, loving your neighbor as yourself. What's the biggest problem in the church world? <laughs> Fighting and fussing. Fighting and fussing. I don't understand why my little girl didn't get to sing. I just don't understand what she can sing. Come on. And, 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 and my husband, he's never been on any boards or any committees, and we've been here for three days. I just don't understand. I don't understand what's going on. Fussing and fighting. Positions, titles, and tags. Are you here? Where there is no law, there is no transgression. And the law that has been given through the lips of Jesus, a new commandment I give unto you, is to love one another. And the only weapon that so the law of love that's written on our hearts is what he fights us with now is to get us to be at against the law of my kingdom. Offense is the weapon of the devil. The 
bait of Satan is to get, brother, I'll guarantee you, going to your church, you'll find somebody offended. It, it's, uh, er, 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 somebody gets offended over nothing. Yes. Yeah. And then you got a, you got a, a, a storm going on. A storm going on. Don't let the enemy get you offended. That, that's what was that was what was going on then. And, and, and then uh, he, he answers a question about David. They said, uh, the, the Lord's supposed to be David's son. And he quotes him a scripture out of Psalms. And he says, no, 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 no. David, King David called the Lord his Lord. And so what he was saying there is, I am authority over David. I'm authority over David. He's told everybody. Read Hebrews. Hebrews tells you that, that Jesus is greater than the angels, greater than Moses, greater than Abraham. Name him, he's greater than. God gave him a name that's above in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. There's not a name. I don't care what you call it. Melanoma, his name is bigger than that. His name is bigger, greater, more awesome than anything that has a name. Now, now he, 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 he fearfully denounces the scribes and the Pharisees, chapter 23 of Matthew. Now he's, I like the next one, poor with his gift. Uh, Mark 12, 41, 44, he's, I don't know where he had time to do all that he did, but he's at the temple and he's, he's standing beside, they had these big troughs where you threw your money in, and he's watching people give their money. And he watched rich people give their money. And he, and, and, and he says there, if you look, he says there, verse 41 through 44, some of them gave big amounts. Then he saw a little widow come up. She gave less than two pennies. And he took note of it. And he declares in verse 44, the rich gave out of just a minor bit of what they had. She gave of her want because she gave how much? All, all she had. Let's say it one more time. She gave all she had. <laughs> I tell you what, you will find very few that's given all that they ever had. Yeah. She gave everything she had. Now, does anybody think that maybe perhaps uh, she had a miracle come her way within a day, two, three, or that hour, that evening. You know she did. Because our God is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Has he ever provided for you? Yes. Have you ever had your back against the wall and he sent a miracle your way? Yes. <laughs> Speaking of income tax day, I remember one time I needed $2,000. Right now, what's his first name? Dennis. 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 Let's pray for him. Father, I pray for, for Mark's stepfather. I pray for Dennis now in the name of Jesus. Whatever the situation, heart, body, lungs, I pray in the name of Jesus you'd be with him, watch over him, touch him, deliver him, heal him. Spare him, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Shelly, you came just to give us that good word. Bless you. But we needed two thousand dollars one tax time. Two thousand. <laughs> now two thousand was big, and I'll never forget praying, asking God, give us a miracle. Man came in my office, said the Lord told me to to give you this. I said praise God, praise God. Handed it to me two thousand dollars on the money. Does anybody think I shout? Amen. Spoke in tongues and jumped and hopped. I'm here to tell you. Because I didn't want my uncle, who I don't claim, come and get me and haul me away. Oh, that was a miracle. Now, did I did I wait for that to happen the next year? Nay, nay. <laughs> I made sure I was paid up by God's grace. But when he's just a good God. And he takes care of us. Amen? Amen. Takes care of us. Now, that poor widow's might, I'm telling you, it's big. Now he starts preaching uh, on the sermon on the end of the world. And it's, it's, it's Matthew 24. Most scholars call Matthew 23, Matthew 24, Matthew 25. If you've got red letter, you'll see it's all red letter. Now you've got the Sermon on the Mount, which is up at Galilee. 
But th this great message in Matthew 23, 24, 25, it's called the discourse on it's called the discourse on the Mount of Olives. Because he's sharing. And man, is he now these are his last, these are his last words. I mean, he's and he's talking about the end. He's dealing with the end of the world. And Matthew, you ought to read Matthew 24. Uh, everybody was stirred up about the blood moon last night, and they thought it was going to be the end of the world. I don't know where they got that. If you, if you read the scriptures, even even over Acts, the first chapter, when, when that's mentioned, it's talking about signs. Signs. I'm going to tell you, we are heading toward the end right now. Uh, but the blood moon is not going to be the end. Matter of fact, it usually... It usually relates to something in Israel. I'm waiting on something dramatic to happen in Israel, and I'm praying it's not the Muslims' attack. You know, there's no sign anywhere that I've heard any Bible prophecy scholar ever say that America is found in last day prophecies. I've never heard anybody uh, say that America is found in last day prophecy. And my concern is that when it comes to standing for Israel, we're not going to do it. God have mercy. I said, God have mercy. Yeah. Got to be careful because we're, we're World Wide Web here, you know. I'm sure our president's probably watching. <laughs> I hear Hagee all the time. John Hagee said, he'll be preaching and he'll say, and now Mr. President. You know, like I'm sure he's watching every time John Hagee preaches. <laughs> now, he, he, he gives, let's look at chapter 24 of Mark uh, real quick. Let's look at verse 1 or verse 4. Through 14. Th these are four primary signs uh, of, of the last days. And, and let's look, chapter 24, starting with verse 4 through verse 14. Are you there yet? Matthew, 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 Matthew thank you, honey. Matthew 24. Starting with verse 4. And Jesus says, Take heed. That no one deceives you. Man, they're deceivers in this world right now. Come on, church. For many will come to me and will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ. I never thought growing up that ever happened. There's a dude in Miami that's got a following of thousands that says he's Jesus. Reverend Sun Moon, this Korean, said he was, he was the Messiah. We're, we're living in a time where there's, they're popping up everywhere saying that they're, they're the Messiah. And so what he said has now come to pass. You're living in that day. He said, many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ and, and will deceive how many? <laughs> many. Verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. Ah, oh, preacher, it's always been that way. Yeah, buddy. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, earthquake in various places. That means that there will be pestilences and earthquakes in places where they have not been before. There's always been earthquakes, but they'll be in places where they've not been before. Has anyone heard of earthquakes recently where they've not been before? Yes. Kentucky! Yep. We had one in West Virginia. Yep. Braxton County. Braxton County. I'll tell you, brothers. Hmm. Now, pestilences, what, what's amazing today is we've got phenomenal medical, it's, it's amazing, the medical that we have, and yet things are popping up where the medical society tells us we've got, we've got nothing to stop. That's serious. That's serious. Let's read on, verse 8. And all these are the beginning, beginning of the sorrows. Verse 9. Then there will, they will deliver you up to tribulation, whoa, and kill you. That's happened. Mm -hmm. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Watch out. Yes. Watch out. The Hindus, who are basically very quiet, mild-mannered religious people, are now viciously, viciously attacking the Christians in India. Vicious. And they, it was always Muslim, but now it's Hindus. So you're seeing other religions coming against Christians. We got one dear brother that Iran has had in prison now for two years. He's, he's an American, too. And he's in jail over there. Those hikers that went into one of the countries, they got out within by 18 months. We got a preacher. Seems like hardly any of the politicians talk about him. Hello. Verse 10. Then many 
will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Whoa, whoa. Verse 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. In Waco, Texas. Jonestown. On and on and on. I was preaching one time, and after a preacher got in the lobby, and a man came up to me. I shook his hand, never seen him before. He smiled at me and said, How are you doing, Jim Jones? I looked at him. I didn't crack a smile. And I said, My name is not Jim Jones. I don't take that stuff lightly. I knew what he was saying. I want to tell you, it's amazing how the enemy will attack the real and deceive people over the false. Preach. Verse 12. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will do what? Oh. Anybody think the church is getting cold? But he who endures to the end, he who holds on, shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then the end will come. I wonder how close we are to preaching the gospel to all the world. How's it been preached to the whole world? Web, uh, television, missionaries. It, it's being preached. Uh, we, we support uh, our ministry. Right Way Ministry supports uh, Jeff Halley. He goes into Mongolia. Goes into Mongolia, up in the mountains of Mongolia, and preaches. He said it's a sight to see what's going on in those places. So those those are the seven preliminary signals. Uh, and then if you read about the abomination desolation, they're talking about the temple and, and uh, they, the, the, the Romans brought a pig in uh, into the Holy of Holies and desecrated the Holy of Holies. And of course there was no, the Ark of the Covenant was not there. The Ark of the Covenant had been taken out. When Jesus Christ was teaching, preaching, the Ark of the Covenant was no longer in the Holy of Holies. There wasn't any glory in the Holy of Holies. They were going through the motions without the Ark of the Covenant in there. It had been taken, it had been hidden during some of the other destructions of the temple. Now, on one of my trips, they take you down underneath. They've excavated, and you go along, and you see you under, down underneath the, 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 the western wall, they're down, way down underneath, there's a big arch. There's a big arch, and it's filled. And, and, and our guide told us that one of the rabbis, before the Muslims up on top with the Dome of the Rockets, that's Muslim, that they, 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 they went back underneath, and one, one of the rabbis took a scope and took it back underneath. All I'm telling you is what they told me. And they saw the ark back there. And then they hit a, they hit a, a, a water line. And the, the Muslims up on top started losing water. And they found out what was going underneath. And they, they raised a ruckus and they sealed it up. They sealed it up. So I didn't get a seat. <laughs> but if I saw it, I told you. <laughs> But I, you know, I don't believe they're saying that that's where it is. That's just what they said. That's what they said. Now, if you read the book of Revelation, you will see the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. And you'll see that. Because everything down here of the temple and the tabernacle were nothing but small imitations of the real thing. Because I believe, according to Hebrews, Jesus took his blood to heaven and put it on the mercy seat in heaven. Hey, and that'll make a Baptist mm, shout. Whoa, that, that's what it was. Now, so, so I'll just go quickly down through because it's getting late. Uh, the Great Tribulation, Matthew 24 through 21. You can read these. I, I, I put them down for you so you can take them home and study. Uh, the coming of the Son of Man, Matthew 24, 29. The seven parables. Look at all he did on Super Tuesday. Some, some things, you know, he did it all after Palm Sunday. Uh, he talks about the fig tree, talks about the times of Noah, the giving in marriage, two men in the field. Now, I, I, I like that number three on the seven parables. Number three, now, that, that to me, that talks about the rapture. I grew up in church where they didn't believe in the rapture. I grew up in a church that believed it was all symbolism. Uh, but but I, 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 I tell you, when he says there's two, when he says there's two in the field and one's taken and one's left, mm, and 
and, and two in bed and one's taken and one's left. Oh, what in the world? What are you talking about? That, that, to me, that's the rapture. They say, well, the word rapture is not used in the scripture. Uh, but, but, but being caught up is. Being caught up is. And so uh, I'm not trying to get you to change your belief, but I, I believe that number three, two men in the field and one taken and two women grinding at the week. And I, I believe that's a rapture. I believe it's a sign of, uh, of the rapture. And uh, I believe he's coming. What in the world is going to happen when, when Jesus takes his church out of this planet? Do you think there's going to be chaos? What, what's, going, what's going to be happening when, when, when a, 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 a lost husband is in bed with his wife and, 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 and she's gone? Huh? Or, or a couple are at home and their, their child is gone. Come on. Too, too late, my brothers and sisters. I tell you, I don't want to be here. You go ahead and be here all you want to, but I don't want to be here when the rapture takes place. Yes, Maria. Would the Holy Spirit still be on the earth? Well, they, they, some of them believe that people are going to get saved, but there's nobody going to get saved unless the Holy Ghost is dealing with people. That's true. That, that's a mystery to me. That's a mystery. How can people get saved when the church is gone? Because that's the church's job. So there's debate, but I hope they do get saved. I don't want anybody lost. But I know one thing. I don't want to be here. Mark, you stay behind and do the preaching. I'm gone. <laughs> Hello? Hey, let me tell you something. What's going to go on? You do not want to be here. You hear me? What's going on during that say You don't want to be on this planet. You, you think you've got tribulation when your cable TV goes out. Well, I'm talking about real tribulation. <laughs> but you ought to read those. Uh, and then he talks about the master of the house, the faithful, the evil servants. The, the, the one, of the, one of my favorite ones, Matthew 25, the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. The only thing that separated them. Five of them had oil. Five of them didn't have oil. Oil is the Holy Ghost. Five, I'm telling you, you've got some good preaching going on there. And then the talents, and then Matthew 25, verse 31 through 46, the final judgment, the sheep and the goats. Sheep on the right, the goats on the left. Someone, someone, I went to somebody's house, they were raising goats, and I told, I told them, I said, I've pastored enough goats, I ain't raising enough goats. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing goats are good for is butt. Oh, I love Pastor Wright. But there's your goat. <laughs> Always button. Oh, you turn your back on them, they'll go to butt you. They will. Now, Wednesday, most scholars believe that Wednesday is silent. But there's some debate about that. Some believe that, that the conspiracy of the Jews against Jesus, Mark 14, Jesus is being anointed in Bethany with the alabaster box. Some believe it happened on, on, on Wednesday. I believe it happened on Tuesday. I believe Tuesday evening when he was in Bethany in Lazarus' house, that's when the woman came in with the alabaster box, broke it, anointed him. Wow. Judas got mad. He said, we could have sold this money and given it to the poor. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> he wasn't worried about the poor because he was the treasurer and he was stealing money out of it. Isn't that awful? He wasn't worried about, he was worried about money. Got caught up in it, didn't he? Be careful. Uh, and then Judas bargains with the priest to betray Jesus. How could he do it? How could he do it? Turn to Luke 22 and I'll show you something. Uh, it's getting, we always stop at 8, but I'm going I'm to be a few minutes old. But look at, look at uh, Luke 22 just for a minute. I'm going to show you something. Jamie and I talked about this, uh, this last week. Luke 22. Luke 22, verse 3 through 6. Are you there? Okay, here we go. Here we go. Verse 3, chapter 22, Luke. So, then Satan entered Judas. Only place in the scriptures where Satan himself entered someone. I know you read in King James where it says that and they were devil possessed. That word in the Greek is not devil. It is demons. Only one place in the scriptures where Satan himself entered anybody, it was Judas. Yes, Look where it happened, though. Verse 3, chapter 22 of Luke. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, 
who was named among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred. Do you see that, Jamie? Yeah. Pastor Jamie? He was filled with the devil before he went and dealt with the religious leaders yes, and sold his soul yes, for yes, some silver. Yes, Satan yes, filled him. And the only way Satan or demons can fill anyone is you submit your will to them. That's right. That's right. That's serious right there. Yep. Remember the question you asked last week about did he did he did he go to heaven? Right. Remember? Right. He's filled with Satan. Yes. I think that pretty much seals it. At least I think it does. Wow. Horror. Horror. And he went, talked to the religious leaders. So he went his way, conferred with the chief priests, captains how he might betray Jesus, and they were glad and agreed to give him money, so he promised and sought opportunity to betray Jesus to them in the absence of the moment. Oh, God have mercy. Now, Monday Thursday, uh, he washed the disciples' feet. You ought to read John 13. He washed their feet. And then they had the Last Supper. Now, the custom was you washed visitors' feet before dinner, but if you'll check, John 3, 13, dinner had ended when he washed their feet. Then he had the Last Supper. Amazing. And then from the Last Supper, they it says before they left the Last Supper, they sang a hymn. I'm sure it was amazing grace how sweet the sound. That's, uh, <laughs> that hymn is Psalms. They sang a Psalms. They sang a Psalms. Left and went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, I'm going to tell you something. John 18. I'll show you something here about, about the Garden of Gethsemane. This, this is amazing. So he goes to the garden. The garden is uh, at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. I've been there several times. Matter of fact, uh, my first trip to Israel, I went into the, the church of all nations where the rock is. And when I got about 10 feet from that rock, I, I began to weep. And I mean tell you, I wept and wept and wept and wept. And uh, every time I go, I always kneel down at that spot and say, I'm here again. I'm back. Look at this, if you would, at chapter 18, real quickly. Verse 1 and 2. When Jesus had spoken these words, this is at the Last Supper, he went out with his disciples over the brook of Kidron, that's the valley, down in the valley, where there was a garden, it's a garden of Gethsemane, which he and his disciples entered. Now watch this, verse 2. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. That means he had prayed there many, 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 many times. That's how Judas knew exactly yeah. where to go right. to take them there. Right. He went to that place of prayer. Yes. Now we know the agony in the garden, it's Mark 14. How many times did his disciples go to sleep? Three times. Three times. Yes. Isn't that amazing? When he needed them the most. Yes. When he needed them the most. How many times has the Holy Ghost woken you up during the night? Yeah. Instead of doing what he told you to do, you went back to sleep. Come on, don't be too mad at these disciples. But many times you wake up and you think he's just, you know, something. No, he's trying to deal with you. He's trying to talk to you. Let me tell you what I do, Debbie. When, when I wake up most of the time, I pray for you. Because she's got two organs in her body that... Her body has to accept. And she needs prayer. Amen. That she get over this hump and get on to the next thing. Jesus' voice failed him when he needed them the most. God help us not to fail him. God help us not to fail him when he needs us the most. And then, of course, Good Friday early the next day, because the garden is nighttime, they came and they arrested him and they take him to Ananias' house. Ananias' house. That's that's the what's the, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. Why they took him there, I don't know. But they took him there, and they interrogated him. Then he took him to Caiaphas' house. And in Caiaphas' house, I've been to Caiaphas' house, there's a prison in, in the basement of his house. Isn't that amazing? A religious leader's got a prison in his, in his basement. And that's where, they, that's where they put him overnight. He was in that basement. You'll see that very clearly in the Passion of the Christ. He's in Caiaphas' prison. And then the next morning, early in the morning, illegally, they have a Sanhedrin meeting. Illegally. Not supposed to do that. But they had it illegally to try Jesus. And then from the Sanhedrin, they take him to Pilate. Pilate deals with him a little bit. 
and, and finds out where he's from, so he sends him to Herod. Herod was like the governor. And they sent him over Herod. Herod makes fun of him. Belittles him. Wants him to do some magic tricks. It's pitiful. And Jesus doesn't do anything. Sends him back to Pilate. And Pilate, Pilate's wife warns him. Don't, don't. That's amazing. She gets warned. And then he tries to get out of it. And they pressure him. You'll be, the, the, Jews, the Jewish leader said, you'll be no friend of Caesar. Yeah. And so finally he just has to give him up. So he turns him, turns him over the crowd and asks, who do you want? Remember Barabbas? This is something you may not know. Barabbas' first name was Jesus. And what Pilate was saying, which Jesus do you want? Which Jesus do you want? Jesus, the king of the Jews, or Jesus, the Barabbas? And they all hollered out what? Barabbas. Isn't that amazing? Which Jesus do you want? Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's amazing. And so from there, you have the way of the cross, which I list scriptures for you. At 9 a.m., he was crucified. He was nailed to the cross at 9 a.m. Seven sayings on the cross. He speaks seven times. First thing he says, Father, do what? Forgive him. Only time Jesus ever calls his heavenly Father, God, is on the cross. My God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? He never, ever, in all of his ministry, ever called his Father, God. He always called him Father. Isn't that amazing? God, oh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So you have the seven sayings, and at three in the afternoon, Jesus says, it is finished. And of course, the earth quaked. The veil of the temple split from top to bottom. Jamie, what did you say about the about a splitting? Why did it go from top to bottom? Heaven to earth. Heaven to earth. No man split it from, from, from the bottom up. They said you could take oxen teams and put them together. You couldn't, you couldn't pull apart the, the veil of the temple. And let me tell you something. When it split, all those priests that were in there looked in and saw that there was no Ark of the Covenant. Well, the only one that had been going in there once a year was the high priest. There was nothing in there. They didn't split that to get God out of there. God wasn't even in there. And they sewed it back up and for several more years went through their motions. I don't want to go through motions. Hey! I don't want to go through motions. I want the real thing. Anybody with me? And then they bury him. Who buries him? Anybody know? Joseph of and Nicodemus. And they go get permission. They get, get a right and permission to bury him. And they bury him in a, in, a, in a tomb that had never been used. And then the Pharisees get all scared. They say that he's talking about he's going to be resurrected. Maybe his disciples are going to come and get him. So they put a, they put a, they put a patrol. They put a patrol in there. Have you ever gone through a have you got a patrol in dead man's grave? I mean we got we got a soldier there at the at the uh, tomb of the unknown soldier marked back and forth, but they put a battalion at a dead man's grave. Lord have mercy. So they buried him. Saturday, nothing happens. And then Sunday <laughs> he's resurrected. He's resurrected. The soldiers fall down like dead men. Yeah, I believe Saturday when he's preaching people hate. Yeah, but scripturally we don't we don't, you know, just his we know his body's in the grave. We know his his spirit is in paradise. The upper regions of Sheol, which we taught about uh, the last time. This is Passion Week. I gave you that because I want you, if you're a Bible student, go over those scriptures during this week and really see what your Savior did. Especially on Friday. Especially on Friday, read those scriptures and see what the Savior did. Uh, all for you and me and the whole world. I hope I didn't bore you. Let's stand. Oh, no. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, how, many, how many of you knew that, that Rabbit's first name was Jesus? It's amazing. Virginia Ruth knew it was him. She's been with me there.
first time I've ever preached. Isn't it good to find things that you've never seen before in the world? Mm, that's a little Prayer request, real quick. Any prayer requests? What's her first name again? Tracy. Tracy. Jim Smith has sent a message in here on the internet. His son, Landon, is going to a neurologist tomorrow. They think he has Tourette's syndrome. Oh. That's the word. Jim Smith's son, first name? Landon. Landon. Needs prayer. Anybody else? Yes. Vicki needs a job. Can we announce it? She sold her home down in Kentucky, finally. We've been praying for that for days and days and days and days. And days. I trust, trust God anoints you on Easter Sunday morning. You're going to have some people there, preacher, that normally aren't in church. I pray that God anoints you. Jamie, you all lay hands on him, our dear pastor friend, and God, God, God anoint him and help him. Some of you men come over and lay hands on Pastor Jamie. He'll be preaching. And, uh, if you don't have a church to go to, we invite you to come to Revival Worship Center, 11 o'clock, Sunday morning. Amen. Praise God, praise God. All those watching by internet, we pray that God will help you. Father, we pray now for every man of God, every woman of God, that will be ministering on Easter Sunday morning. When we celebrate that our Savior is alive, death could not hold him. Father, we thank you for this week. We review, we remember the things that you did during the final week before you were crucified and took the wrath of God in our place. We pray, Lord, that you will help all of us to learn more about your word. Father, we thank you now that you are moving in these last days. Bless those, Lord, who are in the cast at the patch and play, those that are ministering, Lord, in different places. Anoint them, help them. Father, I pray for souls to be saved. I pray for bodies to be healed. Lord Jehovah Jireh, we know that you are our source and our provision. Thank you, Lord, for all those that came tonight. We pray you'd help us each Tuesday night as we study your word. We pray in the name that's above every name, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. amen. Next week, first chapter, starting with verse 13, book of Galatians. Awesome book. We love you. Plenty of food left over there. Lucia North, there's some Mexican desserts over there that'll slap your upper lip. Thank you for coming. God bless you.